Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. We're at that point, I guess, in the morning where we can start to settle into the comfort zone. Well, we don't want to do that, do we? Let's try again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. It's my pleasure to be with you again and what I hope will be a very exciting and engaging panel. Thanks to Ashley for introducing it so eloquently. We're going to be talking about the world order in the age of liquidity. Let's think a little bit together, shall we, about just some of the events we have lived through in the not too distant past. We've spoken recently about change, revolution, sweeping through countries like Sudan, Algeria, the aftermath of the Arab Spring that's still boiling in places like Syria and Libya. We've spoken about the ongoing saga of Brexit in the UK and how that's impacting the entire European Union. We continue to speak about the phenomenon of the rise of Donald Trump in the US. All of that together suggests the current world order is failing to meet people's needs. Some would even say crumbling. Which begs the question then, what comes next? I understand a little bit of other languages and the word in Mandarin for crisis is a mix of words of calamity and opportunity. I guess what, what, what I'm trying to say is, in any change, there is opportunity. There is a light side as well as a dark side. And that's what we want to examine today. Let me uh, invite up to join us on stage our distinguished panel, who I'm sure are going to further our thinking better. First, I'd like to call up Her Excellency, Dr. Merv Kavakji, the Turkish Republic's ambassador to Malaysia. She was a lecturer of international relations at George Washington University. You'll also know her as she was elected to the Turkish parliament, the Grand National Assembly of Turkey in 1999 as the first Muslim woman with hijab. And you remember the saga, I'm sure, how she was prevented from serving her term. Second, I'd like to call up on the stage Dr. John Keane. He's a professor of politics at the University of Sydney and at the, as well as at the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin. He's the co-founder and director of the Sydney Democracy Network and is renowned globally for his creative thinking about democracy. I'd also like to invite up to the stage His Excellency Mr. Marty Nataleguawa, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. Okay. He served, as I said, as the f Foreign Minister of his country, and he, inter alia, is serving as a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Mediation. Well, as I uh, outlined at the beginning, the very structure of power is shifting from a very highly centralized, hierarchical world order into a more flat, networked, and decentralized one. However, this progress could be derailed, we're told, by the rise of global populism, the politics of fear, and economic decline, which are making our world increasingly unstable. What I'm going to do now is to try and kick off a discussion but I think the best discussion will come when we have engagement, as in engagement from you, the audience. There are ushers in the room who have microphones. We've got one gentleman there on the left, and we should have someone else on the right shortly. If you have a question, please don't hesitate, don't hold back. We like it if you're asking questions and engaging with us. I know that in some parts of Asia it's considered rude to ask a question, not in this forum, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kick off 
to get everyone warmed up a little bit with a few questions for our panel. And then I'm going to turn to you and give you an opportunity to start asking your questions, of course, related to the topic we're discussing, envisaging our future in a very liquid political situation and world order situation. Um, let's talk a little bit, if we could, amongst ourselves here in the panel first. I have some interesting stats which I dug up, which I think is not a coincidence, and I'd like to know your thoughts on this. A few years ago, not too long ago, we had a report by Amnesty International which said that the level of divisive rhetoric has reached the narrative of blame and hate and fear took on a global prominence to a level not seen since the 1930s. You may remember this report. In the same year, we had Oxfam state that global inequality had reached a new extreme with the richest 1% now owning more wealth than the rest of the entire world combined. I guess my question to the panel is, is that a coincidence? As wealth, as power, as resources, access to resources are becoming more and more concentrated. We're seeing that sort of wealth divide being reflected in the emotional, cultural, political divide as well. And where is that leading us? Who would like to have a stab at that up here in the... Uh... Please, go ahead, Merv. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Assalatu wa salamu ala rasulina Muhammadu wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thank you for this opportunity. I think I can just dive into this very exciting question. Um, the answer, I think, is both a yes and a no from my perspective. Um, the, the numbers that we have in hand, uh, to, uh, uh, they refer to a, a very bleak uh, picture of the reality of the world, indeed. And um, in a very simple terminology, we can... Um, depict it with the words of haves and have-nots. And uh, this is where we should be alarmed. Uh, uh, the world is much more divided, uh, devised uh, into uh, growing gaps uh, due to a variety of reasons. The reality on the ground shows to us that Indeed, uh, that little percentage of the haves have an upper hand over the larger percentage of the have-nots. Philosophically speaking, when we look at the very uh, fundamental reasons that back that uh, growing gap up, we see uh, the way we approach to what we call modernization. Um, the fact that we all have to follow suit with various uh, developmental procedures in a way to replicate somebody's model. And in this very system, we're not open to new ideas, alternative methodologies, alternative resources of engaging into different progressions and developments, and that in a way uh, uh, imprisons us in our own cage of what I would call the modernization theory. This is where I would like to bring the discussion and start it off with that. Where does that leave the next step going forward? Perhaps John. Uh, well, um, Salamat Pagi, 
Salam alaikum. Um, and um, I just wanted to say thank you very much uh, to the organizers, um, to Wada Hanfa uh, for, and others for support. And it's a great pleasure to be with two excellencies. And also uh, Sami Zaidan, who will not know that almost every evening you are, when you are presenting, you are in my kitchen in Sydney. Delighted to know I've been in your kitchen in Sydney then. <laughs> I'll add that to the yeah. list of places. Okay. So this is a great a personal pleasure. Um, perhaps before speaking about what can be done, uh, what solutions are, we, we need to delve a little bit more deeply into the diagnosis of, of the dynamic that you have both spoken about, this long-term a growth of uh, social and economic inequality in many, almost all, actually existing so-named democracies. This has been going on for at least four decades. Um, it is often attributed to what is called neoliberalism, um, the privatization, uh, the dismantling of public services, has had the effect of disappearing, as um, a French writer has recently put it, disappearing the social question. This is uh, Christophe uh, Juy uh, in a great book called La France Périphérique. And his point is that we are now entering times where the social question is coming back. And who drives it? In the past several years, it's principally populists. Um, household names, Berlusconi, Duterte, Bolsonaro, Marine Le Pen, practically every democracy in which there are freedoms to assemble and to form a party, now witness um, the unprecedented rise of populism. Uh, it's reminiscent of the 1920s and 30s. And what is this populism? Why is it um, so to say, the articulation of this growing inequality problem. Populism is a particular political style that, whose leaders and parties speak all the time about the people. And they appeal to people who feel disaffected. They encourage a rebellion of those who feel disaffected, marginalized. This populism because the concept of the people is so abstract, always, in every case, uh, produces a demagogue, a big boss uh, in politics. Uh, demagogy is intrinsic to populism. And the logic of populism also produces uh, efforts to break up flanking power-sharing institutions. This is not an accidental feature. Trump, as we know, is against uh, the judiciary. He's against journalists, fake news. He's even against the National Football League and he's against the Boy Scouts of America. And this will to simplify things in the name of the people, in the name of the leader, um, a protest against uh, inequality is gripping every democracy. One uh, final consequence, two final consequences of populism in action. By definition, populism involves outgrouping. You have to pick on a group who you say is not part of the real people. It's a great paradox. A style of politics that constantly speaks about the people marginalizes. Well, why is that, John? I mean, you could argue that in a world in which people are feeling left out increasingly, the message of inclusiveness, not exclusiveness, should logically have a wider appeal. The driver, the social force that drives this populism um, is in most cases um, lower middle class, some elements of middle class, um, marginalized peoples who feel colonized, left out, forgotten, and who point the finger. In the past, it was Chinese immigrants, it was railroad operators, it was bankers, last phase of... These days, um, Muslims, um, gays, 
uh, uh, same-sex marriage people, environmentalists, uh, and these outgroups, it's a, Jews increasingly in Hungary uh, are being picked upon. And one final thing to say about this populism is that um, its natural home, as it sees itself, is the territorial state. It wants to build walls. So uh, in just a couple of minutes, I tried to describe what I think is a phenomenon that has democratic qualities. It's produced of democracies, and what could be more democratic than a style of politics that talks the people? But it's a kind of autoimmune disease in democracies, and it is the poisonous fruit, I think, of this 40-year-long um, uh, elimination of the social question and of this unsustainable gap between rich and poor. His Excellency, uh, Dr. Marty, then, are we, is the future the strengthening of the national state? Or is the national state crumbling? Because when we look at some places around the world, it seems like the national state may be crumbling. Iraq, Syria, Libya. So, uh, you know, how do you view what the future looks like and what it holds for the national state? Well, I think one perspective that must, one must underscore and be aware of is that change is permanent. Uh, one can't talk of uh, the structure of power uh, because it gives the impression as if one can snapshot and freeze frame a certain situation, even a certain stratification of power. Uh, in my view, one must talk less of stratification or structure of power, but more of the dynamics of power. Because power, even the constellation of power, in my view, is situation specific. There's no longer today like a, a league whereby one can identify who are the most powerful and the least powerful. Lamenting and criticizing and feeling sorry about the certification, the division and the inequality of the world today has been a perennial, generational, inter-civilizational concern. But it's it, getting worse now, right? Well, so it's, it's, uh, well it, we it's would say so. If nowadays, pe nowadays, people would say so, that this is our time is the most sharpest, the most divisive. But if you had lived in the 70s and the 80s, they would say the same thing. At the time, the economic division between the so-called North and South and the like. I think division certification is a fact of life, but we must understand the dynamics. We are living in a world of paradox. The technology is making it possible for us to be more connected. But I would make the case, actually, whilst the technology is making us more connected potentially, we are actually less connected. You know, we have situations, look at around this room. Sometimes we are sitting so close to one another, but we are not conversing with one another. We are conversing with someone else through our mobile phone. Less could be more, in my view. We are living in a world of paradox of plenty. We are, have more information, but we are less informed. We are less tolerant, tolerant of, to one another. I think the, young, the younger generations must recognize, in my view, technology isn't the panacea. It is only a wherewithal, it's a means. It's a tool. In the end, you have to create the positive dynamics. We have now trust deficits prevalent all throughout the world. We have leaders, but we lack leadership. That is the kind of, in my view, the kind of uh, narrative, the kind of dynamics the youth, if they are speaking of owning their future, must cease. Not to be preoccupied with the wherewithal, with the technology per se, but what drives the technology. Because as I said before, we are now, in my view, living in a world of paradoxes. 
more connected technologically, but less connected socially and politically as well. Going back to your original question, in my view, the nation state will continue to be the level of our, the level of our loyalty where our loyalty lies. But the nation state must be able to answer a perennial and a critical issue, how does it manage the nexus between internal and external domain? The reality that much of our problems nowadays cannot be resolved at the national level alone. It requires partnership. It requires cooperation. And this is where I think we are lacking at the moment. We have leaders, but we are lacking, lacking leadership. Is that giving perhaps uh, Merv some opportunity to the youth, to the community level, to create a new order. And I want to give an example here. We're all familiar, I'm sure, with the trajectory that the current US administration is on when it pulled out. For example, it's very much opposed, uh, its critics would argue, or even itself would argue, to multilateralism or many facets of multilateralism. Well, it pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord. And yet you still had key sections within US society and even key states who said, we're gonna go ahead and work with the principles of the Paris Climate Accord, regardless of what the central authority, the national government has decided. Is that an example that youth can learn from in perhaps in some cases, the nation state may be becoming irrelevant and communities can set their own agendas of common action, inclusiveness, understanding, tolerance of each other. What do you think? Thank you. I think um, to suggest that the nation state is becoming irrelevant is not exactly what I would want to argue for. Uh, but definitely that there is a change in the way we perceive nation states, the power within people, and how the youth and many f different fractions of the society are able to join hands. So, um, if you allow me, I just want to... Uh, Is power changing? Is the definition of power then changing? If it's not about national states, the concept of power. The concept of power in political science, uh, we define it as a person A or an entity A or a country A being able to get whatever it's, it wants uh, by uh, persuading, if not persuading, convincing uh, to get whatever he wants him to do uh, by person B or the country B. And uh, in that way, uh, power is an enigma in of itself. So I'm not able to answer if power itself as a concept is changing, but our approach to assume power is definitely changing. But the, the way you defined it there, that it's country's A ability to convince country B, is it exclusively about countries now? Oh, or are we... definitely not. So in that Country sense... or a person or an enterprise, an embodiment, a social movement. It might be anything and everything right there. Uh, what I want to uh, suggest is that, uh, put to front, is that the picture as we see, as bleak as it may seem, actually has another side. There is a lot of power within people, within aggregates of people and different groups. And therefore, the untapped resources within those groups, aggregates of people, aggregates of countries sometimes, nation states, are being reorganized. From the time of the Cold War, we where we had a bipolar world, we moved into a, maybe some argue a unipolar world or a multipolar world, but I would argue, let's take it to a next step, and actually we are going through a multifaceted, uh, 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 multipolar or uh, collaboration in 
uh, different areas, a multi-layered world where different countries are coming together or different groups from within countries are coming together for a variety of reasons, temporarily or in the long term, maybe permanently uh, for a shared interest. That is the power of the youth that we can untap. Uh, I, I share this view, I would prefer the word heteropolarity um, because multipolarity is a language that belongs to territorial states and their balance of power. Um, but, I, but I would say two things that are qualifying, if I may. The first might be shocking uh, for the audience. I think that we are living through Shakespearean times where nothing, where times seem out of joint. There are a lot of surprises. Uh, what Hanfa said, the future hasn't yet been born. There is a sense of disruption and a sense of fear. And it is in this context that I think we are witnessing we never saw this before globally, the emergence of two empires. The word empire should not be forgotten. The United States and China, they are entangled. This is also unusual. The United States and the Soviet Union were parallel empires. They were the first global empires. We're living in a world where I think the signs are that the American empire, an empire is a big state uh, that uh, spills its power over borders. The American empire is in decline. Its one key remaining resource is military force. It outspends the next eight countries. 15% of its budget is devoted to military force, but it loses every war uh, in my lifetime. And meanwhile, we're witnessing globally the emergence you cannot use this word in China, di guo, empire. We're witnessing the growth of a Chinese empire that has global reach. It is the champion of economic cooperation, uh, witness the formation of an African free trade zone, and so on. It is the trans a... Trans-Pacific Partnership, it's taken up the mantle it, on that It one. has built, um, most people don't realize this, it has built more than 20... Um, multilateral cross-border institutions in the last two decades. But this trend, I think, um, will not be a repetition of the past because of this second point, which is that um, we are also witnessing the rise of cities, the importance in fields like health of um, networked institutions we are witnessing the rise of global publics, of social movements, of civic actions that greatly complicate that empire-driven model. And it is for this reason that the word power needs to be rethought. Mao famously said that political power grows from the barrel of a gun. That is an American view these days. That's no longer the case. So no. How do we define power now, John? I think there are three meanings of power. One is backed by force, you get your way. Two, when people come together collectively, Sudan, this is a, the famous idea of Hannah Arendt, that power actually comes, unlike force, from people acting together, speaking to each other. It, but in a decentralized manner, right? Yes. That's the facets and, of and what's happening in Sudan. There is a third understanding of power, which is Gandhi, it's the feminist movement, it's Michel Foucault, you can exercise power, young people, in the most intimate domains of your lives uh, with your bodies. You change the way you eat, the way you speak, um, the nonviolence of acting together and so on. I mean, so the personal is political. So you can, uh, what I think is relevant is that these three understandings of power are very important and they give us hope. We're speaking to a room full of young people. Your Excellency Marty, what sort of message can we address to young people in thinking about how they exercise power, but how they exercise it as well with meaning, right? Because that's 
I think the basic challenge, that's the theme that I think everybody in one way or another has been addressing us today, that meaning is being emptied out of the current order. People are not finding meaning anymore. So we've, we've got to reintroduce a meaning through which people rally around in the sort of informal or decentralized networks, right? Well, I mean, I view power as being simply as being the capacity to influence outcome. Uh, essentially, whether it be owned by states or owned by individuals. But I, I wouldn't want young people to be so consumed and so driven by the notion of asserting uh, power. I think it's about responsibility. Because you, you, you're, I think the challenge for young people is how they can make positive difference. I wouldn't want to define it as being uh, all-consuming search for power, for authority, because this is what led us in many cases to the difficult situations that we have just now. I think the young people should differentiate themselves and not to be so consumed, to be self-consumed and trying to search authority and, and power in, for its own sake, but to make positive difference. That's a, the point that I was trying to make at the beginning, that we, are, we, are, we don't have to be confined within the notion of a stratified notion of power where there is the most powerful and the weakest. I believe everything is issue dependent. Pick your issue. Climate change, financial inclusion, whatever it is the issue, create your own coalitions of like-minded, similarly driven, whether they be states, whether it be entity corporations, whether it be individuals, and drive to make, seek to make a difference. Because power is not going to be voluntarily given up by the, look at what's happening in the UN Security Council. I served in the UN Security Council twice in my career in, my, in the Indonesian Foreign Ministry, including as its president of the Security Council. And talks about UN reform, making the United Nations more equitable, more democratic, more transparent, more representative, has been going on endlessly. But Marty, the sort of change that you're perhaps advocating that then, will that not place some of the young people in this room, by definition, into a power struggle? Into a, will it not be resisted by the current elites who will that's, see that sort of networking mobilization that, as a threat? That's what I was trying to suggest. You, you can change the currency of power. You can change the narrative. Make it unconventional by having issues discussed. Look at what's happening now in many parts of the world, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, how the young people, young people have driven the climate change agenda. High school kids, young people driving the climate change agenda. For me, that's very empowering and very it gives me a solace to see young people able to drive the agenda. So pick your issues and then drive and take ownership of the issues. Because if you were to work within the traditional stratification of power, well, you know, as I said before, it is not new. There is this sense of injustice between the powerful and the less powerful. Believe me, those who are now less powerful, once they become powerful, they will behave in exactly the same way as the powerful are today. Unless there's some kind of check uh, through the rise of, of those sorts of networks. John, you wanted to, to weigh in on this. Uh, yes. Um, I think, uh, as someone who spent quite a lot of my life uh, trying to revive the old language of civil society, Jami al-Madani, <laughs> It deserves, it went away, it went out of fashion uh, during the last 25 years. But I think there are signs globally that it comes back into fashion. What is a civil society? A civil society is um, networks and organizations of people who value pluralism, nonviolence, respect for the other, the dignity of others, 
and want to protect that at, so to say, arm's length from governments that want to interfere and destroy that pluralism. And I think that you can see, for example, in um, initiatives like Extinction Rebellion, in the um, Friday uh, strikes uh, by uh, children unprecedented in the history of democracies, that 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, actually have a sense of responsibility and a capacity to join with others in a civil society. Civil society is... Um, Civil society is changing now, right? Because yeah, of technology. The content is changing and IoT. In, in a way enabled by this unfinished communications revolution. And it is a basic, among others, it's a basic check upon concentrated arbitrary power wherever it exists. And what we know about concentrated arbitrary power in any form is that it's prone to hubris, to blindness, to foolishness, to stupidity decisions that can often have evil effects. Uh, one last uh, comment for young people. Please don't, please don't hate and dislike old people. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a good point now to turn it back <laughs> to the floor and see if we have any questions. If you do have a question, and I encourage you to come forth with your question. Put your hand up. We'll get a microphone to you. There's a gentleman there. I would ask you um, to start by stating, yes, the gentleman may go ahead, st start with stating your name and professional affiliation. And of course, just a reminder to please keep your questions brief and uh, to remember that they should be related to the topic we're discussing. Go ahead, sir. Okay, uh, my name is Mohammed Nasif. I'm currently a st student studying economics and finance. Uh, my question is, with uh, this rise of nationalism and um, dictatorship, especially in the Middle East, do you think it's culturally embedded in many of the people, mostly in the Middle East, to praise the, this rule of the one-man show or the, having this inspiredly, like, divine, uh, divinely inspired leader? Do you think this is a, um, a, a, a major problem in the mentality of the people supporting nationalism? Maybe I may start on that. Um, the discussion on uh, Middle Eastern countries and one-man shows and dictatorialships uh, goes back to the idea that Muslim peoples have an inclination towards authoritarianism and they lack the values of democracy. Um, there's that camp who believes in that and then there's another camp who argues that no, uh, Muslims and where they come from, Islam actually is uh, not incompatible with democratic values in them uh, they carry those values very much, and it has been uh, this discussion, and the people on both sides of the aisle have been sort of um, having a contention over this for decades. But the interesting thing uh, is that uh, while uh, some argued that one-man shows in Middle East uh, are very prevalent when we look at the reality, those one mans were always under the patronage and cloak and support of the Western uh, neocolonializers. Um, so they were the friends of what we call the West. And here I use the word West uh, with a very large, um, uh, uh, as a large expression, uh, knowing that generalizations would put us into difficulty as academics, as thinkers, but for the purpose of this discussion, uh, while we recognize that West is not only one West, it's not homogeneous, it's very heterogeneous. What we mean is the leadership in the sort of modernized leading countries, country X or country B, doesn't matter, but we know, and some of our colleagues here, here mentioned even names uh, of countries that lead, right? Um, 
While that is the case, we know that uh, these uh, dictators were always supported by those Western leadership. But there is another side to this. Now the world is changing. Middle East is also changing. Some of the bleak pictures that we see around the world have a bright side to it as well. Even at nation state levels, we have great leaderships in this country who speak up for the truth, while UN Security Council members keep very quiet, right? We have leaderships in, in a country like mine, in Turkey, where we could say that the world is greater than five by meaning that in the UN Security Council, a few countries hold the destiny of the whole world in their hands, and that is not just right. And we have countries and peoples uniting together, even leaderships who are the voice of a variety of geographies from different parts of the world, being affiliated with a leadership in country X or country B, even if they have low blood relationship with them because they stand up for the truth. So uh, these multifaceted, multi-laddered uh, 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 collaborations are where we see the civil society, which is supposed to be generally within a nation state, but now we're talking about a global civil society to prove that in the Middle East, one man shows will not suffice will not ever live, will finally come to an end where people, the ones who stand up for the justice and the truth, can unite with leaderships despite uh, their geographic demarcations. Thank you. Thank you. That's We'll get a microphone in a second. That's, that's a, a beautiful vision, I guess, of how we'd like the world to function. Perhaps we shouldn't forget, though, at the same time that we have seen and are witnessing instances of popular movements being suppressed quite brutally. Syria comes to mind, where a decentralized mobilization of the masses can face significant lashback from existing power structures. Um, it reminds me of the story of the lion and the wolf and the fox going out to hunt. And the lion comes back to his den as the traditional king of the jungle. And so they've each caught their prey and asked the wolf, what do you think we should do with our respective preys? And the wolf says, well, quite logically, thinking as logical, responsible members of a civil society. You know, I think you should eat your prey, I'll have mine, and the, uh, the fox eats his. At which point, the lion lashes out and strikes the head of the wolf completely, flying off of his body. And then the lion turns to the fox and says, well, what do you think, fox, we should do with our respective prey? So, of course, the fox is watching this lion's head uh, this wolf's head splattered all over the place and says, I think you should eat your and mine and the wolf's. And he says, Where did you learn such wisdom, says the lion. He said, well, from the, the head of the flying wolf that splattered all over the cave. Are we at a, a risk of over-romanticizing perhaps what we would like to happen and are other lessons like the wolf's head being set by the brutal suppression of populist mobilizations, and how do we counter that when we address the youth? Because, you know, ultimately we're, we're giving people a message to go out and try and mobilize themselves. They're gonna come across some real lions in the jungle, though. I believe there is, there is no one size fits all. Uh, every country's situation, every region's situation would be unique. But since we are meeting here in this part of the world, in Southeast Asia, if you were to look around this region, uh, there are examples of what I would call 
successful transformation, successful democratic transformation. My own country, or the country where I come from, Indonesia, two decades ago, transformed peacefully from what had been an authoritarian state to what is now one of the most vibrant democracy in the world, proof that Islam, democracy, and modernity can go hand in hand. We are not without problems, obviously, but the transformation that took place took place without geopolitical repercussions, without the kind of conflict that we are now seeing in, much, in parts of the Middle East and North Africa. One thought that I would like to share, perhaps there is a role for the region uh, to play. In our case, in Southeast Asia, we are fortunate to have ASEAN as a context, as a framework. It is not the most perfect of organization, but it has managed in its own ways in synergizing the local, national, regional, and global, creating space and possibilities. Look at the transformation that Malaysia had gone through the, over the past year. Indonesia, the Philippines, and others. So as, as I said before, there is not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, every country is unique, every region is unique, but there is plenty of examples here in this part of the world, but most of all, I think the, the culture of peace, the culture of dialogue, of engagement, mushawara, to achieve mufakat, we say in Indonesia, is important. Otherwise, if the region is divided, as we are seeing in Syria, for instance, I'm not obviously an expert, but we are seeing a perfect storm. What had been initially a local problem becomes a national-wide, region-wide, and now a proxy global contest. Right. This part of the world had a script, managed to manage that kind of transition. And I think as you are all gathered here in this part of the world, I would encourage you to to be aware of what, how we have been trying to deal with our own problems so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and, and, and see how things right. are. On that point of Mushawra, maybe a good point to transition to the gentleman who had a question. Who's got the microphone? I see a few hands. There we go. And then I think there's gentlemen in the front row. And we have, I believe, a lady. Let's not uh, forget the, the lady there as well. All right, go ahead, sir. Maybe we'll collect a bunch of questions and answer them. Could you go ahead, sir, once again, briefly with your question? Okay, it will be very brief. Mohammed Khamasa from Al Jazeera. Uh, my question for uh, John Kane about the, we were talking about power and these things. When we're back to the power definition, we're talking about two. Uh, main elements in this formula. We're talking about majority and minority. And back to the season of Deleuze and uh, Podio, the majority and minority is not like a concept of, of uh, quantity. Uh, in this world, after this globalization uh, uh, storm, if we can say, the minority is like the majority of population, but has the minority power, and the minority population has the majority power in this field especially after globalizations. So what are the, the elements of the new generation to regain their majority in, in, in stand of quantity, not on money in this case? So, so how can the new generation regain its power, basically? I think there was a lady. Can we get the microphone? Oh, the, all right, go ahead, the gentleman here. And then we'll take the lady if she, she puts thank her you, hand Sam. up again. Uh, thank you, Sam. Mohammed Affan, short forum. Uh, I have just short comment about uh, this dichotomy between traditional power versus the modern power or liquid power. I think it's more complicated than that. If we follow the, um, the Hegelian uh, dialectic about this uh, synthesis and uh, this thesis antithesis, we are witnessing now resurgence of the old traditional power with a new formula. For example, in the Middle East, we can see um, a resurgence of uh, old Mamluk style in the form of military rule. Or we can find um, a, a form of medieval brutality, but with new content and new tools. Even in the West, now we, we are witnessing a second wave of fascism that is similar to uh, one century ago fascism, but with new content and with new tool. So this is the question. That it's, it's more complicated than we have solid traditional power versus liquid uh, dispersed postmodern power. 
Okay. Thank you very much. We've got two questions so far. I'll recap them as we get the microphone, please, to the lady behind there. Raise your hand. So we've got one question about basically how uh, the youth can regain their voice and sense of power. Another question about whether what we're really seeing is a resurgence of traditional power structure. And the lady is now going to give us a third question. Go ahead. Okay, good morning. So uh, my name is Nina. Uh, my question is really about the idea of democracy. So we've, um, the panelists have talked about the multi-order um, heteropolarity or multiplex world order. So, and many countries right now are experimenting with democracy. So what is, how would you characterize democracies today? And how would you characterize democracy in the future? Would there be a certain trend of democracy or will there be uh, I guess multiple ideas of democracy. I guess Prof Keen, you've also argued in one of your, um, some of your works about Chinese phantom democracy and how that has really, you know, forced us to radically think about the notion of democracy. So um, that's all. Thank you. Beautiful question. All right. Maybe uh, Merv, you talked a little bit, didn't you, about the the concept of multipolarity? Why don't you? tackle for us the third question, then we'll work back the other Indeed. way around. Indeed. Uh, that's an important question. Uh, the democracy um, definition that we are given, if you will, by the producers of knowledge, whoever that producers of knowledge might be, indeed, involves mass political participation, free elections and transparency and accountability and uh, 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 liberal order of economic dealings. Um, and interestingly, as far as the Muslim countries are concerned, uh, they throw in another element of secularization, the separation of church and state affairs uh, into the package uh, when they measure the democratization processes uh, up against the Muslim countries' achievements. Um, uh, democracy can be different for different countries. One fits all kind of democratization is in of itself is antithetical to the human nature. But at times we are forced to adapt and adapt uh, democratization processes as are seen in a country X and country Y. Um, um, Muslim democracies, South Asian democracies or uh, uh, African democracies do not always have to look the same as, say, the American democracy or the Canadian democracy. The democracy in UK is different than the democracy in France, right. in the United States. But when we are all treated as the South, in the discussion of North and South divide, or the countries when we are divided as the haves and have-nots in this hierarchical order, we are always somehow coerced in an interesting way to adopt the model of varying countries that have power in global uh, world politics. Right. That is what we need to resist and create our own haute couture, shall we say, tailored, very indigenous take on democratization. All right, we've got just a couple of minutes left. And we've got two questions to answer. John, one was uh, to you about the, the youth finding their power, and then maybe we'll pose the other one to Marty. Go ahead, John. Uh, Briefly. <laughs> yes. Um, we could be here for the rest of the day discussing these great questions. I think I wanted to say just two things in reply to the questions about majority, minority, violence, um, and democracy. And thank you for these, uh, Shokran. Uh, the two things I want to say is, first of all, if you've got time, um, you might want to look 
at a new history of democracy that took me 10 years to write. Um, it's far too big, it's a thousand pages, it's coming in Arabic soon, I'm honored to say. But in that story, I tried to write, I think for the first time, a global history of democracy which changes this Atlantic-centered understanding of liberal democracy, you know, with an American accent. India is not a liberal democracy. Indonesia is not. Uh, and what I try to say in this book is that elections, the majority-minority principle, is losing its grip on the meaning of democracy if you think about democracy historically. You will see in this book that it has Eastern origins. Assemblies are a product of Syria Mesopotamia, not of the Greek world. And you will also see in this book that what I try, try to say is that there's something very big going on in the ethic, the norm, the vision of democracy, so that it is less election-centered and it is more about the abuse of power. It's almost Churchill to say that we still, we human beings still have not invented any better method of constraining the abuse of power wherever it happens in the family, in economic life, in government, than mechanisms that restrain power in the name of equality of people in their living environments. So I tried in this book to redefine the meaning of democracy so that it's more capacious, so that it's open to these local understandings that does not specify that you have to believe in liberal individualism to be a Democrat. That seems to me to be anti-democratic. The second thing, if I may very briefly say, is about hope um, for young people. Um, Sami, you, you keep coming back to us with depressing remarks about, you know, don't forget the real world of violence and dictatorship. You are right about this. But I would say, um, just to plant one thought very, very briefly, think, try to think as young people historically about some big changes that are happening in our world so that you see the novelties that seem to me to be promising and I can spot four. One is that the communications, unfinished communications revolution knows no territorial state boundaries by nature. It's potentially global. It encourages, enables um, interconnection on a scale that cannot be compared to the age of radio and television and the newspaper. Second trend is, I think, all the historians tell us that there is a thickening of uh, different types of institutions, many of them cross-border, that greatly complicate the territorial state nationalist model of politics. Third trend is the bomb. Whether we like it or not, um, nuclear weapons do have a certain stabilizing effect because they heighten the sense that we can destroy ourselves. And the, third, the fourth trend all of this makes, I think, is bad news for dictators and demagogues and nationalists. The fourth trend is, I think, environmentally, something very big is going on. You know, this rise of awareness that we have reached, um, the limits of our presumption that we are the masters and possessors of nature, this is actually destroying the very relationship with biomes upon which we depend. Species destruction, um, rising temperatures, anarchic weather, these are all symptoms of this. This cannot go on. For these four reasons, it seems to me, the prospects for hope that peoples in different contexts can gather through their representatives democratically solve problems. It seems to me that that's not just I like that message of hope. I think that's a, a good one. Very briefly, so Your Excellency Marty, if I could give you, I don't know, 30 seconds. Yep. Positive note, uh, perhaps addressing some of the questions about how to face the resurgence of traditional power in a positive way for young people. Well, thank you. I'm conscious of the limitation of time. Uh, very quickly, the notion of majority and minority, I think, is a little, a little bit problematic in many 
in some contexts. In countries that are fundamentally diverse, marked by their diversity, the notion of majority and minority is not one we would want to be uh, propagating. We should be celebrating diversity uh, and not merely tolerating diversity, but celebrating and ensuring that there is not uh, a quantitative approach as if there is one majority and the minority that had to, to, be, to, be, to, be, at, uh, to be subservient. But in other words, for a more inclusive, cons consensus-based, mushawara for mukfakat uh, approach uh, for this kind of situation. Uh, just some concluding thoughts I wanted to, to impart. One is the notion of power once again. Simply capacity to make a difference. Extremely important, but for young people not to be too consumed by it because it's ultimately, I think it's about responsibility. Because if you were simply driven by the search for power for its own sake, then you will be no better than your previous generations. Your, the young generations must, must distinguish themselves by emphasizing what good that they can bring to, the rest, to, 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 to humanity, to the world, by focusing, as I said before, the notion of issues. You can be drivers for change on specific issues and build coalitions, build like-minded uh, people who are similarly driven and not to simply be uh, despondent and expecting some kind of a charitable, uh, 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 what you call it, transfer of power from one to the other. And, uh, and democracy, as I said before, uh, is, it is not a one-size-fits-all, but in this part of the world, in Southeast Asia, for those who are keen to see evidence of where Islam, democracy, and modernity can go hand in hand peacefully, Southeast Asia is a good place to start as any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. It was a difficult task to try and uh, address the world order in an age of liquidity, which ultimately is kind of like finding that happy marriage between all the different stakeholders uh, in a situation where they have to be able to find a way to live with one another in that balance. And as a, a wise man once told me, there's one secret, one secret to a happy marriage. I wish he could have told me he said it was a secret, but I imagine if it was, it would have been good communication as a starting point. And we've definitely, we may not have found and agreed on what the next world order is, which as Mr. Khanfo said, hasn't been born yet, but we've definitely begun and continued to enrich the dialogue about it. So with that, I thank all of our speakers here in the panel, and I thank you, the audience. I'll hand you over to Ashley now. Thank you very much.